Hi everyone. To kick off 2019, I've decided to do a series of videos on parasitic infections of the gastrointestinal tract and liver, because what could be a better way to start a new year? Um, so to start with, we're going to talk about Entamoeba histolytica. Um, as usual, for all parasitic infections, you want to follow that rule of thumb that I taught you about way back when, when we first kind of defined what these eukaryotic organisms are. Um, and that's kind of the timeline. How did my patient get it? And how am I going to recognize it in my patient? So to understand that, I don't think you need to memorize every single life cycle for every single parasite that we talk about. Um, they're too varied. There's too many parasites in the world. Really, the only life cycle that I insist students learn is plasmodium because that's the cause of malaria, which is kind of a big deal. Um, but for entamoeba and a lot of the ones that we're going to follow after, there's a couple things you might want to keep in mind. First off, for every parasitic infection, you absolutely need to know what the diagnostic form is, i.e., how am I going to recognize it in my patient, and the infective form, i.e., how did my patient contract it, okay? Um, and then some of the other things you might want to keep in mind, most of the parasites I'm going to talk about in this series of videos are contracted through a fecal oral route, meaning that somehow you ate the infective form. But some of them also have kind of an auto-infection route where it actually gets in through your lungs, you cough it up, swallow it, and then it infects you through your gastrointestinal tract. So let's talk about some of the parasites that do that in this series of videos. We're going to start with Entamoeba histolytica. Okay, so first off, as its name implies, Entamoeba is an amoeba. Um, amoeba are really primitive unicellular microorganisms, and their life cycle can largely be divided into two stages. The first is the trophozoite, which I'm showing here in A. Okay, This is actually the actively motile feeding stage. The second stage of their life cycle is the cyst, which I'm showing here in B. This is the quiescent, resistant, and infective stage, okay? Um, so motility during this trophozoite stage is actually reliant on a pseudopod, okay? Pseudopod literally means false foot. The pseudopod is basically an extrusion of the cellular ectoplasm, which pulls the rest of the organism along with it. Um, most of the amoeba found in humans are commensals. But E. histolytica, unlike the other entamoeba that you, know, you might come across, is actually an important human pathogen, okay? So your diagnostic form are either finding cysts or trophozoites forms. They can be found in fecal specimens from infected patients. Um, the, the trophozoites can also be found in the large intestines, particularly within the crypts. And you're going to want to distinguish Entamoeba histolytica from the other forms of Entamoeba, which are largely just commensal, which patients might just have. And those parasites are basically symbionts or um, parasites that just aren't causing us any problems. They just happen to live in our gastrointestinal tract. The infective form um, is when occurs when mature cysts are passed in the stools of infected patients and then ingested by the next victim. Um, where are we going to find these? We're going to find them worldwide. You can find these all over the place. Um, there's actually a pretty high incidence in tropical and subtropical locations, um, particularly where there's poor sanitation and contaminated water. You're going to find that to be a general theme with a lot of gastrointestinal infections. Um, contaminated water is both the simplest and most difficult thing to combat. Um, average prevalence of infection in tropical and subtropical regions is about 10 to 15 percent, particularly in areas where there's water problems. Um, most of the infected individuals, though, are going to be asymptomatic carriers. The reason that's a problem is that they actually represent a reservoir for the spread of E. histolytica to others who maybe won't be asymptomatic. Um, in the U.S., our prevalence is only about 1 to 2 percent. We largely have very clean water here. Um, and the main source of infection is basically asymptomatic carriers who pass cysts. Where this actually becomes a problem in the United States is places where people live in close proximity, as well as places with poor hygiene. So 
places where people live in close proximity. We're thinking um, long-term care facilities, um, military barracks, people are living very, very closely. Um, refugee camps. Refugee camps typically have poor hygiene, poor access to water, and people living in very close proximity. Prisons, obviously people live in close proximity there. And then places with poor hygiene and close proximity would also be daycare centers. Um, children are just little vectors of disease that fling their bodies around the world. And daycare centers are a perfect example of this. You'll see gastrointestinal infections going all over the places. Um, in addition to just people, flies and cockroaches can actually serve as mechanical vectors. Um, and if you have a sewage problem where the sewage contains cysts, that can contaminate water systems, wells, springs, and agricultural areas, um, particularly in places where human waste is used as fertilizer. I know we don't normally think of human waste as a fertilizer, but technically it could be. Um, there is also a sexual component. Um, you, when we think about this, um, some of the pathogens that we talk about we don't necessarily think of them as STIs, but E. histolytica can actually be an STI when there's oral anal sexual practices um, involved. Um, so that can also lead to the spread of disease. Okay, so how do we actually get disease? So I literally just got finished telling you guys that you don't need to know the whole life cycle. And here is an image of a life cycle from the CDC. But this is actually kind of a master image. So this isn't the life cycle for just Entamoeba histolytica. It's the life cycle for actually a lot of different amoebiasis um, infections. So let's just kind of talk through what this looks like. So we know that the cyst is the infective form, right? So mature cysts pass in the stool of an asymptomatic carrier or a patient that is experiencing symptoms. The cysts then are picked up through ingestion. So it's fecal oral, we ingest the cysts. The cysts are going to pass through the stomach. The gastric acid of the stomach actually releases the pathogenic trophozoite from the cyst, okay? So it exists, okay? The trophozoite then divides, and what happens when it divides is that it causes local necrosis in the large intestine. And this is actually due to a lot of things, not just the division of the organism, but also a cytotoxin that is produced by the organism. Then, also within the um, colon, Epithelial cells, human neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, all of these um, are, are kind of altered by the presence of the trophozoites. Um, so we can actually see that we get increased membrane permeability, which leads to irreversible increase in intracellular calcium levels, which is obviously very harmful to all of these cells. Um, when we get release of toxic neutrophil co um, components, so think about it, neutrophils are um, really pro-inflammatory molecules that release all sorts of nasty enzymes, um, reactive oxygen species, um, the azerophilic and um, specific granules, all of these things, those are going to contribute to tissue destruction. You also can get kind of a flask-shaped ulceration in the intestinal mucosa, um, and those present with inflammation and hemorrhage and often secondary bacterial infection, which isn't something that I think we naturally think about, but anytime you have this much damage to the epithelium of your colon, remember that the epithelium of the colon is basically little bricks that form a wall that keep the um, normal gut bacterial mucosa intact. Um, and when we make breaks in that through inflammation or damage or abscess, the bacteria that happily reside within your colon can leak out and cause peritonitis or um, any sort of peritoneal infection. Um, invasion into the deeper mucosa with extension into the peritoneal cavity can occur. And in that case, you can actually get the organism going into the bloodstream. And when it gets into the bloodstream, it actually can um, go to different organs. And the most common one is that it'll go to the liver, but sometimes it goes to the lungs, brain, and heart. Okay, so what kind of diseases are we talking about? Well, first off, sometimes no disease. 
Um, asymptomatic carriage is actually fairly common, but that actually is an important part of the life cycle, right? Because in asymptomatic carriage, we can still have shedding of those mature cysts, and then other people are infected by the mature cysts, and they may or may not become an asymptomatic carrier, or they could become somebody who actually experiences disease. Disease is kind of classified into two different sections, okay? So you have intestinal amoebiasis, and then you have extra intestinal amoebiasis. In intestinal amoebiasis, the majority of infections are asymptomatic, as I just discussed. But when we have clinical amoebiasis, you have a subacute presentation, abdominal pain, cramping, diarrhea with bloody stools, more severe disease is actually characterized by basically the number of bloody stools per day. If you have extra intestinal amoebiasis, you're going to have more systemic signs, right? Because we've left the local organ, okay? So we're gonna have fever, leukocytosis, maybe rigors. Um, the liver is actually the primary site where we're going to see that secondary organ involvement, right? Um, and this is because trophozoites in the blood are actually removed from the blood in the liver. So the liver is doing its job, but as a result of doing its job, it basically got infected. So in this case, you're gonna have abscess formation in the right lobe. That's the most common place. And it's going to lead to pain over the liver, um, hepatomegaly, and an elevation of the diaphragm as we get kind of inflammation in that area, okay? So how do we diagnose this thing? Well, first off, you could examine the stool. However, this is inherently insensitive. Um, the parasites are actually concentrated in the intestinal ulcers and at margins of abscesses, meaning that it's hard to find them in the stool. If you do multiple stool specimens, which again, somebody with intestinal amoebiasis is definitely going to be able to provide you with multiple stool specimens. But if you did multiple stool specimen um, collection and then examined them, you might actually be able to find the trophozoites or the mature cysts in the stool. Um, you can actually diagnose extra intestinal amoebiasis by looking um, using scanning procedures for the liver and other organs that you would expect it to go to based on symptomology. Um, but the other thing you could do is serology. Okay, so serology is kind of a double-edged sword. In the U.S., serology is actually fairly helpful um, because we have a pretty low incidence of E. histolytica. But if you go to tropical and subtropical areas, it's a little bit less useful because those are endemic areas. And it's possible that um, what you're seeing is a past infection or an asymptomatic carriage. Um, so serology, use it, but with a grain of salt. Um, treatment, I'm going to largely leave this to farm, but just kind of what I've been able to dig up. If you have acute fulminating amoebiasis, typically it looks like they treat with metronidazole. Um, but if, and there are some other um, anti-parasitic parasitics that people will use. Preventing it is both easy and incredibly difficult. Clean water, safe food handling practices, and safe sex. Those are your best ways for avoiding. And that's all I'm going to say about Entamoeba histolytica, which I think is more than anybody ever wanted to know at this point. Um, but we're going to do a whole slew of other videos on gastrointestinal worms.